Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Of course, I'm sitting with my best friend, Tony. What's up, buddy? What's happening, homie? Uh, well, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone that's been listening in the month of October. Um, we've been dedicated to do uh, uh, Inner Health Month um, for the month of October 20, what year are we, 2023? Um, in 2023. Um, and, you know, we, we've we built it as Inner Health. Stuff was like 2019. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, for real. We just had that whole conversation. <laughs> but um, but uh, for Inner Health, we, we've we we've built it as Inner Health because we want you to be a proactive member in your own uh, mental health. So uh, so to me, Inner Health sounds a little bit more like, hey, we're working on it as opposed to like, you know, letting. Being labeled. Being or... labeled something. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I, I've grown this past month uh, by listening, uh, having these conversations, you know what I mean? And then you reflect on your own life and the things that you might be uh, struggling with or things that, you know what I mean, you find challenges with. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people that go through these things, they found something that that might help them. And, you know, by listening to it, 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 it might help you. And, that's sure. what I kind of find, you know. Sure, I think it, it's like it, we've been talking about the tools, right? And, yeah. the, and the tools and how to do it. And I think that, I think that even if you listen to this five years from now, I think you you pick up different tools because you know what's that old saying? Uh, when the student's ready, the teacher arrives, or something like that. You know, whatever that like. I think it's an old Chinese proverb or something, but you know, so that's it. So, you know, maybe you're not, maybe we're not, maybe one's not ready for five years to, 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 to hear the whole message or, you know, whatever message is out there. So, you know, anyways, I would encourage anyone to, to, to keep listening and being an active member in their own um, mental health journey. So today's guest, I'm super excited about. Um, we, how do we always say that as an industry? Is it an industry or we just do it? Super excited, but I am super excited. So I, I believe we actually talked about doing the podcast way back in 2019 when we first started this. I know that when we first started our podcast, we were looking at what the other podcasts in our industry was, and and our guest today was one of them. Um, I'm pretty sure she started at just about the same time that we started our podcast. Um, but most importantly, that uh, she spent some time here in the old DMV, so I'm sure we'll get into that story. And also, um, she's also dear, dear friends with someone who um, I, I see as a mentor, as a leader, as an everything to this industry. And now, after all of that, he's also a very dear friend and someone that I can call on at any time that I need to. And that's Mr. Gordon Miller. I know that um, I know that uh, they are besties. And 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 anyways. Should we get in? Yeah, let's do it, brother. Okay, awesome. So our guest today is Miss the one and only Miss Nina Kovner. Uh, if you follow, if you don't follow Nina, you need to follow Nina. Um, she is uh, she she's 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 always on the edge of 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 these kind of conversations, and I appreciate her for that. I also appreciate how much she's um she gives to the industry in, in this sense. Um, and and anyways, I'm just a big fan. I mean, anytime somebody makes themselves vulnerable in front in front of everybody else to not for themselves but just for the better as a whole as a community i mean you got to take your hat off to form and then oh here we go <laughs> well, i just got my hair cut so it's a little bit like uh like conan o'brien today so if you're uh, if you're not tuning in you should be just to see my weft but anyways miss nina Kovner, welcome to your day off thank you so much it's so awesome to finally make this happen i i'm so honored and and grateful and and so supportive of course of uh of not just this month uh, of course this month is is, is a great theme and, and topic but of everything that that you all do so thank you thank you yeah, for thank having you. me thank uh -huh. you so I, i'm gonna would start off like like didn't you go to graham webb or teach at graham webb or something uh, no, but I did go to beauty school in Falls Church, Virginia. That's it, man. 
That's it. So we came out of there, you know, we came out of the Graham Webb uh, uh, world. So uh, we are very familiar with. with I remember, I mean, I remember those times I was on the East coast. It was, um, I graduated in 87 from beauty school. So I think I was on the East coast from like 86 uh, and then to 91 and 91, I moved back to LA. Well, that's so funny because we started hair school in 91. So that was, uh, we, we just kind of like missed each other in the, in yeah. the, in the DMV. <laughs> hair world, right? That's crazy. So you're originally from LA? I am born and raised. I am actually, I was born in Encino, California. So I am a Valley girl through and through. How the heck did you end up in, uh, on the East coast for two years? Thank you. Or three or my, five, five years. I'm sorry. My mom's family, uh, is from the East coast. So I grew up visiting every year, <clears throat> going to Virginia and, uh, in, I, when I graduated high school, I was kind of on the typical, typical for my family, go to college, but I wasn't, I didn't want to go to college. I, I wasn't ready for college. I was actually in a really, really bad place, struggling with talk about mental health, um, uh, drug addiction. Like I was not healthy. And so um, that failed miserably. I failed miserably uh, in the, the college experience. And so uh, my mom, who was living on the East Coast at the time, drove cross country, picked me up and brought me to Virginia at 19 yeah whoa it's <laughs> so cool yeah well, not cool in, in a cool way but it's cool that she kind of picked you up and, and and you know brought you brought you back smuggled smuggled you to virginia yeah yeah which was of course you know kind of a culture shock uh but you know i, I my entire career started on the east coast and uh the last place i lived before headed heading back to la was baltimore and I lived on Charles Street, like right in the heart. And I shared a wall with the biggest gay club in the city. And, you know, in my early 20s, like it was just the best experience, like some of the greatest memories. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. And Baltimore, yeah. was like, that was like the, the, the John Waters Baltimore then, right? John Waters Baltimore, absolutely through and through. Speaking yes. of like, I heard a story where like John Waters, when he was like as famous as he's ever been, actually hitchhiked across America. Have you heard this story? I haven't. No. So he left Baltimore and hitchhiked all the way to LA. And he's, you know, as famous as you know, he is when he did it. So um, I don't know if he ever did anything with it or wrote a book about it, but but I heard that story. I don't even know if it's true now that I'm thinking about it. But anyway, <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless. Yeah. That's cool. So are you still practicing hair? No, uh, I stopped doing hair full time in the salon a year and a half after I graduated beauty school. When, when I was in beauty school, I assisted, I assisted in the salon part time. And then when I ran out of money, I assisted full time and went to school, you know, night school so oh. I could graduate and get my license. Um, also when I was in beauty school, I used to follow educators around the area and go and like wash hair and get them coffee at all of their hair shows. So I became an educator very early after I graduated from beauty school. And about a year and a half after that, the local distributor called and said, we need help. Uh, we'd love for you to come work with us and be a brand manager. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. But yes, <laughs> what, was, that, was that was that Davidson's Davidson Beauty Supply? Yeah, uh, sign me up. So anyway, so so I mean, not two years after graduation, I was responsible for marketing, sales, building an education team uh, for the biggest distributor in the country. You know, at the time, one of the most sophisticated distributors at the time, they had a Mac computer. I mean. What? Nobody had a Mac back then, you know, they had their own creative department. I mean, I learned, I learned everything, you know, I learned so, so much, uh, working with them. And then in 1991, um, I, I worked for just for context, just to make this conversation so much simpler. I worked for John Paul Mitchell systems for 25 years. So just 
know that before passion squared. Uh, so John Paul called me, he said, you want to come back to LA? And I was like, I mean, yeah. And so that's how I ended up back in LA and, and, and working directly for, for, for the organization. However, the last time I did hair was actually right before I moved back to LA and, uh, the salon that I had assisted in through beauty school. And I worked in before I went to Davidson. Uh, one of the owners was very sick. I mean, we were in the middle of the worst AIDS crisis and it was a, a horrific time, a horrific time for so many of my friends and loved ones. And he was sick. And the other owner said, can you come in and take care of his clients? And so I went back in the salon for a few weeks in 1991, as my friend was dying to uh, take care of his clients. And that was the last time I did hair in the salon. Of course, throughout my career, since I was responsible, not only for marketing, but also education, I did, you know, I, I always pulled a mannequin and, you know, played around and sometimes did, you know, family hair, but it, it's, it's, it, 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 that was kind of it. And then, um, it wasn't until, okay. I'm already, I'm, I'm already in tears and we're like only like, we're only a few minutes in, mm -hmm. um, the last time I cut hair was in, um, June of 2020. And, um, I cut my mom's hair, um, and she, uh, died not from the haircut. Um, don't know. We'll never know. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that was the last haircut I I've done. Did. Whoa. All right. So how long after the haircut did she die? Just a few weeks. Oh, you know, so sorry, man. Yeah. My condolences for real. Yeah. Thank you. I, you know, I've lost, uh, I've lost 16 loved ones since 2020 and, uh, I know I'm not alone in that. You think it had but anything to do with the pandemic or? I mean, some of it was pandemic related. Some of it was pandemic adjacent. Um, some of it was mental health and illness. Um, some of it was, you know, just, it just what, you know, it just was a, it's been a horrible few years. And again, I know I'm not alone in that. I know I'm not alone in that. Well, so yeah, I hadn't thought about that haircut until you just brought that up. So Hmm. Yeah. Woo. All right. Well, I, I don't know where we're in. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good job, Nina. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Way to bring it. So Nina, I, I know that like, you know, even prior to 2020, you know, you, you, you've talked a lot about, about, you know, um, well-being and, 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 and mental health and, and that what are, are there, is there anything that you can kind of share with like, you know, through your own journey, like tools or anything like we were talking about earlier, like, like, what do you, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then, and then we'll pick back up. Okay. Well, uh, context, which is always so important. I, um, like many people had a, a pretty brutal, uh, childhood. And, um, I was one of those high functioning, like depressed people, high functioning, um, addicts, high functioning, you know, all of those things. And all of my outsides were amazing. I had the house, the car, the title, the big salary. I had the best life, you know, looking from the outside. Um, however, I, um, had a nervous breakdown in 2007, um, at the height of my, it sounds so cliche, I was 41, I think at the time. And, um, uh, <clears throat> I was just planning my exit, you know, um, and like pretty seriously planning to just peace out. And I picked up the phone and uh, my brother had been at a treatment center the year prior, and I had the resources, the means to, um, to, to go there. I, and I went the next day and um, it was a 35 day inpatient called the Meadows. 
in Wickenburg, Arizona. And I mean, it saved my life. And so all the things that I talk about when I talk about mental health, mental wellness, healthy boundaries, codependency, all the interconnectedness of it all, it, it's everything that I learned when that journey began uh, in March of 2007. What made you pick up the phone? You know, wow. I, on, I mean, I think part of it is like, I wasn't dying. Like I wanted to, but like, I wasn't, you know, like I kept just hoping I wasn't going to wake up, but then I just kept waking up and I was tired. Did you, you know, I, I was tired. Did you see a change in your brother? Never. Were you went in? No. Mm. To I this think, day. Uh, I think, and, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but even like speaking through my own journey, like, you know, it, it's not, when you're in that state, it's not always because you want to give up. It's that, it's that, it's that, that seems like the easier path. Like there's so much pain in where you're living that that seems like there's, 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 it's an easier, I don't know what the follow-up is because normally it's like an easier life, but it's like, it's, there's just so much pain in where you're standing that, that even, even, even drastic measures seem like they would feel better. It's almost like a relief. Almost like a relief. Like, like I, I compare it to, and I, and I've never been a cutter or anything like that, but, but I compare it to cutting. Like I understand cutting because sometimes when you're lower than cutting yourself, cutting yourself can, can, can make you feel better. Like if you look at like, if you look at pain, like on a linear line, right. And if cutting is like a one, sometimes if you're at a half, you know, like, like that cutting can make you feel better. And I don't even know if that's true, but that's, that's kind of the way that I understood that. And I also understood that, you know, when, when you're making plans to, 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 to end it all, that maybe that's, that's, the, you're somewhere, you're somewhere lower on that linear line. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but, but that's how. Yeah. I yeah. So, you know, it, it, it completely opened my eyes to, even though everything seemed so great, things were so horrible and it was just a culmination, you know, I, it, for most of us, it catches up with us and we don't know when it's going to catch up with us because, you know, trauma sits so, 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 so deep. And so, I mean, it may come to the surface the pandemic obviously triggered a lot of trauma for people and created new traumas for people. But I was, uh, one of my isms is it was workaholism. And so being a workaholic is, is just another numbing agent. And, and it, it just fed perfectly into my career, traveling the world, being responsible for a global brand. Uh, and, um, you know, just never stopping. Yeah. No, no. days off, you know, all that <laughs> hustle, hustle, hustle. Cause when uh, you stop, you, you don't have to think about it. it oh, you just keep moving. no. Yeah. Cause this is, this is, this is what I'm here for. Right. Uh, um, you know, I I'm here to do this. This is, this is my purpose, my identity, my whole existence. This is how I get my worth and esteem and value. This is people love me. Um, <laughs> just right. keep working, keep making money, keep the party going and everything's going to be great until it's not until it's not, you know? So so many of the tools that I use today were really tools that I discovered, you know, in, in, in treatment in those first 35 days. And, and one of them, which is so cliche and, and, and talked about so often is gratitude. And, you know, <clears throat> the, the way that the program was set up, you know, we had group and we had individual, we had all different types of things all day. And one of the things to get into our group in the morning is we had to bring in a gratitude list. We weren't allowed to get into group without a gratitude list, which I thought was the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard. And there was nothing to be grateful for. Like, are you kidding me? Like my life is a disaster. I, I, I just was so out of perspective and so out of, you know, my mind literally. So like my first few gratitude lists were like ice. Cause they had a great ice machine. <laughs> I call it ice to this day. I still call it rehab ice. You know, it's that pebble ice 
Yes. That's like soft. It's we call that we call that diner ice, right? Like it's like at all diner the- ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rehab, yeah, rehab. So I would be like ice, and then of course my dogs, and then I was <laughs> my Louis Vuitton book bag. Like, I mean, can you imagine, right? right. And then you know, then I was uh, introduced to. Um, the quote from, of course, we had a lot of reading and, you know, books and stuff. And the quote from Melody Beatty about gratitude, you know, um, which I actually have tattooed on my arm. Um, gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough. The more, you know, you've heard it. So uh, that was kind of a light bulb moment for me because things weren't great yet making those gratitude lists in the morning helped me understand that things aren't great. And also this. And so gratitude for me, daily gratitude, daily gratitude practice is simply a grounder, a perspective keeper. Mm -hmm. Because to this day, I still struggle to stay alive. And it's my most used tool. I have treatment resistant depression. So I am raw dogging my mental health issues. Ooh, so well, I, want to back, <laughs> I want to get back to gratitude too. Cause I, 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 it's one of those things that I certainly want to be a part of my, I'm aware that I need to put it in my practice, but then it's like remembering to do it or like to do it. But, but sometimes, but sometimes if it's, if like the demons are speaking inside, you know, like, like I can go, Oh, this is the time, right? Like, like, but I'm almost using it as treatment as opposed yeah. to preventative as, as pro as opposed to like a prophylactic. I'm using it as like, <laughs> I'm using it as like, Oh man, I'm just like in a really bad place in my head. So, you know, let me, let me go back and make a list. Yeah. And uh, trust me, there are days, especially the last four years that I have found none. But what, what, what are you grateful for today? Well, I just turned 57 yesterday. Welcome. I happy mean, not birthday. welcome. Happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, it's a miracle. So I'm grateful to be alive. Uh, I, I don't have my journal with me next to me because I, I write a list every morning. But uh, so that I would say being alive is 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 a big one today. I am grateful for that. And I am grateful to be able to share this space with you and, and your community. Same. It's such an honor and and a gift and and none you know one that I do not take for granted at all. So I'm super grateful that we're connected. Uh, same, same, completely. Um, I'm I'm glad that I'm I'm kind of like I open up the podcast saying that you know we we kind of talk like in 2019, but but you know I think that everything happens when it's supposed to happen, and and today is the supposed to, you know. So so thank yeah. you for that and thank you for being you know kind of open to this conversation. And as you sure. said, I mean. You know, everything, everything that you do, you said raw dog. And I think everything that you do feels raw. And I mean that yeah. as much as I can. Um, you know, I think that it, it just, it, it feels raw, you know, and that's, we, we need that perspective as well. Um, so is there anything else other than what else other than like gratitude are, are you, are you like, like we mentioned it before, like with boundaries or guardrails or anything like that? Uh, well, I mean, another, another tool that I've been using a a lot in the last year has been nature. Mm. And again, I know these sound cliche and, and, and I know that these, these conversations require nuance and I'm not saying like cure your depression, just go look at a tree. Like, please, I'm in it with you. I know, I know I was on suicide watch in 2020 and 2021. I get it. Like this is a one moment at a time experience and it's different for all of us. Um, however, I, I, I did read a book that was recommended to me by my therapist because again, having treatment resistant depression 
is, is very difficult because I mean, I would love to take a pill that could help me kind of move through some things. Those pills don't work. Alternative treatments have not worked. Nothing has worked. So my interest in all, you know, an alternative to an alternative is, is some days it's high and some days I do give up, you know, I just am like, eh, like this isn't worth it. So again, context, I want to make sure people understand this isn't like, oh, Nina's doing great. I mean, in this moment, yeah, but you know, not always. So, you know, we have become so utterly disconnected as a society. And some of that is because of the things we love so much, social and digital, which have brought us together and all the amazing things that it's done. However, it's also disconnected us to a degree we've never seen in our lifetime because we didn't have this before. And so this book that I was reading talked about nature, just trying to reconnect to the most simple things that are actually healthy for us. And so I just happen to live in Portland, Oregon, in I call it a tree house. It's not a tree house, but in my mind, it's a tree house. And I live in a forest. It's not really a forest, but for me, it's a forest. And so I've spent a lot of time like feeding the birds and the squirrels and just trying to stay present and connected to the simple things and like the the awesomeness of just watching how they live, how they survive, um, it, the trees, the leaves, the seasons coming from LA. We didn't have season. Like what's a season, you know? So really paying attention to like how everything works together has really been a healing for me. Uh, <laughs> So every day I try to like take some time to just hang out with the squirrels and the birds and, um, and the trees and like check on like everybody's like growth and situation. And it's just, it's just so there's, there's so much wisdom just in watching like how leaves grow and how they die and how they let go and how they thrive and how they renew and, I totally sound like I uh, sound like that person. I'm that I'm totally person. It with you, because I, I mean, as you're explaining it, I can see my my mind just going quiet as I observe. Yes. I just allow the peace. Yes. And you know, just to kind of just fall yeah. upon you while you just kind of bring it all in. I I I feel it. I, yeah. I, and you know, even like the rain, people are like, "Oh, the Pacific Northwest, you're going to be miserable." And I'm like, "Oh, no, 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 no." Like the, the weather here is so aligned with my entire existence. And, you know, I, in, in LA, like if there was one drop of rain, like everyone had 60 umbrellas. I've never had an umbrella since I moved here. Wow. Like it's not good. You know, it's like, let it rain, yeah. let it rain. And it's, it's beautiful. And I know like some of it's my age, some of it's like the time in my life, like I, I'm in my nature era for sure. But my interest was out of desperation because right. I've been in Oregon for five years. I didn't tap into this until a year ago. Right. I was desperate. I mean, desperate. And, you know, I, I, I was desperate. I get it. Um, we were, so Tony and I, two years ago, we were in Zion national park. And as we're, as we're in Zion, um, our first night there, I looked up and I had seen a skylight like I had never seen in my life. And I had this thought and going back to being disconnected, I had this thought that maybe our disconnection started 150 years ago or 125 years ago when our cities like blinded us from the stars, right? Because I think that it's impossible to look up at those stars. It's impossible to visit one of our national parks. It's impossible to see these things that are much grander than you that um and not be both disconnected and connected to it you know meaning like there's this big yin and yang when you see these kind of things it's like oh i'm a part of something bigger 
um and like i'm i'm an important like cog in this you know bigger kind of world um and then i started thinking like i wonder if like light pollution was our first like our first mm-hmm. introduction to being disconnected because that that was the sky always everywhere until like we had like these big like city light pollution things and it just got me just got me uh, to think about you know what is disconnection and and that yeah. and that for for millions or certainly you know tens of thousands of years as long as humans have been on earth like we were forced to be connected with nature because it was the nemesis of our life or it was the healing of our life right it was both things right. you know so now now with, with 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 the invention of like medicine and stuff like it's less connected there and and as far as like our own visual well-being um yeah uh, and i mean it's a privilege, you know, to, to live in nature, you know, not everyone has access to that. Uh, so, but it definitely has been like a big part of my current state. So that's hopeful and, uh, hope is a big tool, you know, cause so I do seek that. I, I, there were many years I didn't have it, which is frustrating because, you know, after 2007, I thought, you know, gosh, I'm healed. This is great. I get worse. And it, it was, it was great until it wasn't again. Right. Yeah. Do you, do you ever, uh, do you ever do your nature walks like barefooted? Uh, that's a good question. I have had, in addition to all this emotional um, distress. I've also had a lot of physical issues the last few years, including two torn meniscuses. Oof. Uh... So walking has not been my thing, <laughs> but I'm trying to heal and I will be barefoot in the forest. I, I really am working hard to build strength back and uh, 2023 was a big kind of transformative year for me uh, personally, as I woke up on the first and said, I'm going to keep trying. Mm. I made that commitment to myself on the first of the year. Uh, So I, uh, I wish it was faster. Like I wish that things happened faster. I wish I was stronger than I am right now. However, life goes on, right? And more issues come up. It's, you know, it's not been the worst year, but it's not been an easy year either. Right. But I am working towards getting stronger and I, I will be walking in the forest very soon. It's funny that you brought up being barefoot because there was a study that just came out and a lot of people never put their feet on outside ground. And when you do that, your body discharges. And uh, someone did a uh, an experiment when they just walked out with their shoes um, and it reads zero electricity, right? Mm-hmm. Once he took his shoes off and he stepped on the ground and went off the charts and your body is connected to the earth, it's it discharges. So when we don't put our feet, literal feet on the ground and we always stay inside, uh, that takes a toll um, over time on our bodies, on our mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just tells us that that's what we're supposed to be. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and that you're connected to it. Right. Like even, even if you go out there barefooted, like, or whatever, when, whenever you're out in nature, you know, um, we want to resist that we're connected to it. But I think that, you know, like this experiment that you mentioned, like it's proof that we should be connected here or that we are not that we should be, that we are connected here, you know, yeah, there's, walk there's another no... park and uh, just take your shoes off and just sit there for a couple of minutes and let just let your body discharge, put your shoes back on and walk where you're walking. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. If you can walk in the forest, even better. Yeah, there's your challenge. You know, once you get to the forest, just pull your shoes off. Even if you're yeah, I'm just outside. talking about the forest in my backyard. I'll get there. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I walk barefoot in my backyard all the time. Then my wife yells at me. It's your fear. <laughs> yeah, hey, listen. <laughs> I'm discharged though. <laughs> I'm not, uh, Nina, listen, I'm not, I'm not hating on your forest, man. It doesn't matter. Nope. No, go to the forest. Come yeah. visit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'd, we'd love to come. Listen, out we have a bunch of friends in Portland, so we might take you up on that. It's pretty magical. 
That's, that's what we hear, man. It's amazing. It's definitely what we hear. I've never been to the Pacific Northwest. Neither have I, but I want to. I think the furthest north, San, no, San Francisco, I guess, or Lake Tahoe. What I don't know what's further north over there, but you know, we'll be in Salt Lake City this weekend, though. But that's a whole other story. That's a whole other conversation. Nina, so you talk a lot about boundaries, and I kind of want to get into this because I have a love hate relationship with boundaries. Um, so, uh, so I want to, uh, I want to, I want to hear. Well, you, 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 I, the mic's open. Okay. Oh, I love this. So, uh, yeah, healthy boundaries. Okay, got it. Healthy boundaries is, is is the key differentiator. When going back to 2007, when I entered treatment, the, the Meadows has a very unique uh, uh, approach to treatment. And it's all founded in childhood trauma and codependency, as they believe the root cause of many of addiction and depression and so many of the things that we struggle with as a society. And so a huge focus of our treatment was um, processing trauma and understanding codependency. So uh, boundary issues are a symptom, so to speak, of, of codependency. And when my brother was in that treatment center in 2006, I was at family week and they were talking about boundaries and I'd never heard the word. <laughs> and I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> And whatever that is, I don't have that. Like whatever, whatever this is, I don't have it. And so, you know, who knew a year later, I would be sitting there learning about it. So, you know, it's literally how we build our esteem. It's how we build our functional adult. You know, the, the wounded child is, is usually how we show up when we haven't been able to heal and process trauma and, and all of that. And so you have all of these messed up communications and messed up dysfunction and, you know, family system stuff. And so when you start to heal that, that wounded child and grow into a functional adult, you start learning how to communicate. You start learning how to engage, you learn how to function, um, beside, you know, people, whether it's business or, you know, business or your life. And that's really where, where healthy boundaries come in. So when I wrote my book in 2019, um, I, I wrote a little kind of like a, it wasn't like a note to self, but it was almost like an affirmation. And basically it starts, I care about you and I care about me. Whereas the codependent, the people pleaser, the perfectionist puts literally everyone else's needs and existence on a pedestal and says, my needs don't matter. My happiness doesn't matter. My health doesn't matter. My nothing matters. All that matters is that you're happy, that you love me, that you accept me. It's all external. And so we end up resentful, angry, with low self-esteem, burnt out. It, it, it's just, and, and so when I looked at my own experience, not having, not having any boundaries as a workaholic, as a codependent, as a perfectionist, as a people pleaser, it literally almost killed me. Uh, so when I got out of treatment in 2007, I went back to work. I didn't think I could ever work again in my situation. Right. I went back to work and I was told, you know, don't make any big decisions for a year. And I was like, okay. And I ended up leaving two years later. I resigned. I gave six months notice. Never in my entire life. Did I think I would ever leave? I was a lifer. I was at the top of my game. And there were many clues along the way, but one, one statement was, I was having a conversation with somebody and they're like, I miss the old Nina. And I'm like, cool. Great. Uh, that Nina's gone 
or as Taylor Swift would say, that Nina can't come to the phone right now. Why? Because she's dead, mm-hmm. right? So healthy boundary Nina was not very liked <laughs> because no one had ever met them before. <laughs> <laughs> And for people that don't have any experience with healthy boundaries, they don't like healthy boundaries because it's like, wait, what? You're not going to work 17 hours a day. You're not going to take care of literally everyone else's stuff. You're not going to, you're not, where'd you go? What, what happened? You know, and whether that's in the salon with, you know, you start to work on your healthy boundary practice and then you get pushed back. Of course, you're going to get pushed back. That's okay, though. I know it's uncomfortable. It's all uncomfortable. Right. I'm uncomfortable right now. Like, I'm comfortable, but I'm not comfortable, you know? So as I started working with individually with clients at Passion Squared back in 2012, uh, one of the first things I recognized was how much people struggled with boundaries. Uh, healthy boundaries. And, uh, you know, the, 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 co- the, the uh, result of that is obvious. We see it in our industry constantly angry, burnt out, resentful, feeling less than esteem issues. We, we see it all the time. Do you think that, do you think that it's, um, it's more prevalent? I know it's prevalent everywhere, but do you think it's more prevalent in the, in our industry? Do you think it's the, the type of people that we attract or, Uh, I see it more prevalent with creatives and I see creatives having more childhood trauma and issues. Do they have more childhood trauma or is it the way in which they process childhood trauma? Well, it depends who you're working with because I mean, not everyone had, had access to what I had access to in 2007. You know, I mean, very little, very few folks have access to what I had access to because it's ridiculously expensive. And I was fortunate and privileged to have the means back then. I could not do that today. Even though I did go back there in 2021, but it was only for a week. It was only for a week. Um, we just call that so, a, huh? We just call that a visit. Not a yeah, stay. yeah. Not it a was a, a it was a um, complex grief and trauma. Uh, workshop week anyways so i i think that i think that whether you have actual trauma or you just had a dysfunctional family system which most of us do because i mean that's just the way the world works you it's very possible that you were not raised with healthy boundaries you were not raised with healthy communication you were not raised with building esteem you were not raised. So, I mean, we learn what we learn, uh, just like with anything, right? And so I was raised in a boundaryless environment. There were no boundaries. I was raised in an abusive environment. And what happens is, is that according to the Meadows Treatment Center, is that um, we stop developing emotionally at the age of the first big abuses and traumas. So when I entered treatment, they said I had the emotional age development of a 12 year old and I was 41. Mm. And so when we kind of go back to that, their approach to codependency, this is about rate rate growing ourselves up emotionally raising ourselves up into adults, into what they call, I think, functional adult. So when we see, we see this on the internet, people like fighting rah, 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 or, or we see in business, you know, kind of like when people are like, God, they're, they're acting like a child or that's just childish behavior. I mean, many of us are, 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 are children in that emotional state where we haven't had the access, the resources, the understanding, the readiness to be like, you know what? I've got some work to do. It is hard, not just financially and time-wise and, you know, access-wise. It's it's hard emotionally-wise. 
you know? And so the, the, the best we can do like with anything and what I work to do through passion squared is to provide resources, provide access, build awareness to support people that want to go on that journey. Uh, because one of our promises is we work from the inside out. And the reason why is because my experience says the outside isn't going to really matter if you're crumbling on the inside. Yeah. And, and, and to your point on when, when you're serving everybody else and putting everybody else else above yourself and everybody's happy and everybody loves you. And as soon as you start to focus a little bit inward and try to take care of yourself and those people uh, that have issues with that, you got to remove yourselves from them anyways, because they're, they're only in it for themselves. They don't care about you. Or they don't understand because or they don't have the tools to do their own work, which is where this pushback with healthy boundaries comes. And, and also the misunderstanding, which I've seen a lot since the pandemic, that healthy boundaries are the same as walls. They are not walls. Block is a wall. You're dead to me is a wall. You showed up late once for your appointment. You're dead to me. That's a wall. Healthy boundaries are like, I care about you and I care about me. I'm glad you brought that up because when, when we opened this up and I said my resistance or my love hate with boundaries, it's exactly that. It's exactly like it's, it's using boundaries to frankly be a jerk. Or to be a jerk, to be manipulative. No, healthy boundaries are about love. They're about respect, mm. connection. We're driving connection with healthy boundaries. We're saying, look, I love you. And I want to be clear that this is what I need. And I want to be clear on what you need. And we're going to be clear in our communications, in our salon business agreements, in our you know, communication in our, whatever, that's what this looks like. Here are the tools, you know, wh whatever those things are. And that's all the things we talk about with our clients at Passion Squared. So then we at least know that we're like, we have done everything we can. We've been clear, consistent. Um, Brene Brown says clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So we're clear, we're consistent, we're kind, aligned with our brand because always aligned with our brand. Um, and then the, with, with the outcome being, let's have healthy relationships, healthy relationships with mutual respect. Uh, back to that little affirmation in the book, I, I, it, it, it ends like something like, I want you to like me, but not in exchange for me not liking me. We tend, we, the creative, we, the codependent, we, the perfectionist, the people pleaser, tend to, to sit in extreme thinking. Of course, recovery, this is talked about a lot in recovery, right? Extreme black and white thinking. Healthy boundaries is not codependence, is not walls, is not independent. You're dead to me. It's none of those things. It's that, it's the center, right? It's the center where we're working together to have some sort of healthy relationship. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody doesn't leave. Somebody can leave. Somebody can, you can still fire a client or a, a team member or, or whatever. However, it doesn't, it doesn't, that, that's still healthy boundaries. It still doesn't have to be cruel. It doesn't have to be angry. It doesn't have to be um, projecting. It doesn't, we don't have to be resentful. As long as we set the table clear up front. And so this is the stuff that I see every day in our industry. It's the stuff that I've worked on with clients since the beginning. In fact, when I started a school, which is our salon owners coaching program in 2015, our first workshop was a healthy boundary workshop <laughs> because without that, it is a bumpy, bumpy road and, and so much time and energy is exhausted on again, resentment, anger, you know, all of those things. And, 
what that does to our own esteem and worth, I mean, it's horrible. So it's hard. It's uncomfortable. It, I still, to this day, if I have difficult situations, I have a framework, a conversation framework that I write everything out, get clear because I don't want to react. I don't want to respond out of outside of my integrity. I'm, I still do it. We all still do it because we're human. I want to try to not do it as often. I, I want to, I want to try to to, to, to stand grounded in my integrity. And again, aligned with my brand, if we're talking in the context of business, that is where we build our own confidence. That's where we build self-esteem, self versus other esteem, which is the stuff we get from the outside, which is, which is fleeting, right? Followers, bank balances, material things. It's a lot and it saved my life. And so, you know, I'm committed. I'm committed. You know what? I'm so glad that you're amazing. You, you, you are amazing. You're amazing because you can articulate your journey. I think that sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. You know, um, I, I, I'm so glad that you brought up confidence and how confidence is kind of rolled into this. Um, you also brought up something that's absolutely part of my practice. And I've talked about it a couple of times on the podcast, but um, is, is, is my practice is to respond and not to react, you know, mm-hmm. it's like that beat to go like, okay, now how can we respond to this? You know, um, I'm definitely a processor. Um, sometimes it takes me a full day to process, you know, but, 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 I think yeah. that, but, but I'm, but I'm much happier with the response that I have a full day later than the reaction that I would have in, in, in the moment. Um, and the conversation that I had with myself is, have I ever been reactive and gotten a positive result? And it's a resounding no, you know, sometimes in the moment it feels right and it feels like I won, but in the big picture, you probably didn't, especially if it's with someone that you love, especially if it's with someone that, 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 that you respect, um, you know, like, like, am, am I willing to react and, and hurt my long-term relationship with my wife or my kids? Mm, you know, where's the win there? Um, so yeah. that's, that's absolutely been a big part of my practice. And, but with that comes confidence, like, Oh, you know what? I don't have to react. You know, I can be respond. I can be responsible for myself. And, and with that comes that confidence. It doesn't happen right away, you know, yeah. but, but, but no. you strike that up as a win, you know, and, 100%. and the more wins you have in your life, then the more confident you feel about your life. Yeah. I mean, the power is definitely in the pause for sure. Ooh, I and like it's that. hard. The power is in the pause. I'm going to steal that. Matter of fact, maybe this. we name the podcast, the power <laughs> is in the pause. I like that. It, it, but when we go back to those, those, um, that, that codependency model that I was talking about from the meadows, and we, we, when we look at, uh, the wounded child versus the function, functional, functional adult, it makes sense when we see some of these reactions and responses and behaviors that happen every day in, on the internet, every day in business, in life, in the salon, you know, everywhere. And it's like, Oh God. yeah. Okay. Like that makes sense. You know, the more we understand healthy boundaries, the more compassion we can have for others, the more grace we can extend to others. And again, not being in black and white extreme thinking, not excusing bad behavior, not excusing, but we can hold compassion and grace while still not excusing a a certain behavior. And, and that, that is also, so hard to do and takes a lot of practice. Takes a lot. It takes a lot of practice, you know, um, you know, you're talking about grace and stuff. And, um, and then you, earlier you're talking about like our parents and our relationship with our parents and stuff, but you know, what's been, and, and this can only happen with age and this can only happen with perspective is that um, let's not forget that our parents, at least mine, they had me when they were in their early twenties, let's not forget that they were also growing while they were raising. Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and, and, and there's not, I mean, there's not too many 23 year olds that I would trust with raising my child now, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so why would my parents be any different? 
than yeah. that. And this is only this 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 happens, you know, it, it can only happen with perspective on being both on both sides of that, you know. And by the way, no shade to the 23-year-olds. Please don't DM me. You know? <laughs> I'm in awe. I mean, I'm in awe of the young people. Our future generations inspire me so much every day. I feel like I'm an elder Gen X, but I mean, most days I feel like a Gen Z. Sometimes I feel like a millennial. Uh, I I definitely am, as we know, in, it, I think it was nine, uh, in 2007, I was told I was emotionally 12. So now we're in 2023. I feel like I'm maybe like 22. <laughs> like, I think I, I think I've gotten to about that. And uh for 15 years to get to 10 years. Right? Yeah, I mean counting. <laughs> yeah. And some days I go back to 12, right? And sure. then some days maybe I feel, you know, like I, I've really gotten into maybe my 30s. Uh, this is the th this is so much about self-awareness because you had mentioned when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I was into self-help shit from day one. Like I used to read quotes from chicken soup for the soul when I was 20, every time I opened a education class or a sales meeting. So, I mean, Louise, Hey, the crystals, I had it all. Oh, I had it all. <laughs> that wasn't that, that wasn't enough. Right. Eventually, like I said, it did catch up with me and in, 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 you know, in a terrible way. And so this journey has, has definitely been one of hard work and, um, imperfection and bumpiness and all those things. However, I do feel I'm still here for a reason because there's so many reasons why I shouldn't be. And that also is kind of what drives me in, in doing this work and continuing to share this work with our industry who I just so desperately want all of us to be able to feel more joy. And it's really hard to do when we're in a constant battle with ourselves and with each other. And that does come with age. I mean, you know, that, that definitely comes with age, at least for me. That's been my experience. Well, I could not think of a better parting uh, 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 gift than that was. Nina, um, if people want to follow you, if they want to get in touch with you, how, how does this happen? At Passion Squared everywhere so at passion squared on the instas on the everything yeah uh, that's a nina uh nina you are a gift to the industry uh we appreciate this hour more than you possibly could know um and i'm sure many 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 people are listening in um will appreciate it as well but but most importantly uh gordon miller will appreciate it and that's all that really matters <laughs> <laughs> I know we love Gordon. <laughs> love Gordon, like man, what a what a gift he is to the industry as well. Yeah. Miss Nina Kovner, thank you very very much for joining us on Yo Deo. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.